Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, Dr. Kidd, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to give you a quick uh, introduction. I'm just going to kick it over to you so we can have as much time as possible. Okay. Um, but thank you again for joining us. Again, folks, this is, this is a great opportunity. We're really delighted to have Dr. Jennifer Kidd with us today. And um, this is one in a series of Open Education Ambassador trainings. And so if you haven't had a chance to review some of the others, please do so. We are recording this session, so please keep that in mind. Um, and those will all be posted on our YouTube channel at the Department of Higher Ed. Um, this session actually was spurred from a recommendation from one of our campuses. And so that's really exciting. Um, Ellen Metter at Auraria Library had recommended um, Dr. Kidd to present. And so we're super excited about this particular opportunity. And so I wanted to introduce Dr. Jennifer Kidd uh, before I kick it over to you. And she's currently a full-time lecturer at Old Dominion University. Previously, she taught fifth grade and kindergarten in public schools, managed an international preschool in Budapest, that sounds amazing, mm -hmm. and managed a technology-related grant. Um, she earned her PhD in urban services, education and curriculum and instruction from Old Dominion University. And you all had kind of read her teaser on her um, workshop today, but I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Kidd. Thank you so much for joining us, and the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask is there, I can't remember in Zoom, is there a chat function so people could type in responses or question, to questions or post questions, or is that not a capability of Zoom? I can't remember. Yes, there is a chat function. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if I can see that, but maybe that's something that you can enable or you can help me out with. Yep, I, um, can, I can monitor the chat. Okay. Because um, I wanted to ask people some questions as we went through so that this was more interactive instead of me just talking the entire time um, it would give you an opportunity to uh, respond to some of the questions that I'm posing and that would be that would be great. Okay, well, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I called this uh, create your own open educational resources through uh, open pedagogy. So I wanted to, to start with a question to everyone, which is why I was hoping we'd have a chat here. And I was curious, you know, what do people mean by the term open? So some of us use the term open or we hear the term open. And I'm curious what folks, what comes to mind when you hear that term? So is there any way for me to see the chat, what people are typing? Yeah, you should have a little box at the bottom of your bar um, that has a chat kind of um, logo. Or emblem, but if folks want to write in the chat, what 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 do we mean by open? I can also read that too. Or um, if you feel like speaking up, you can unmute yourself as well. But there on the bottom, Jennifer, of your screen, there should be a little chat kind of on the bottom of the Zoom panel. Head and lawyers see all sides. Toggle. I don't see it on mine, so. And I do see some um, answers coming through, so here's some, I'll go ahead and read them to you. Okay. Extensive sharing possible, free and openly licensed, free of fee and copyright issues. These are some of the things that are coming through. Okay, wait, so what I'm gonna say is, I things that I often hear when people are using the word open, um, open to access means that you can get it, right? You don't have to pay for it, essentially. It's free. Um, going like a little bit further than that, open to reuse. So you can access it and you can also use it for your own means, share it with others. Um, and this kind of third level of open to create, open to contribute. And again, I think that's kind of going along a continuum of greater openness. Um, and so for me, that's the open I prefer. Definitely open to access, open to reuse, but pushing further, further um, open to create so that we're um, all potentially contributing to resources. And I have this other question thrown in here, you know, how does openness relate to control and power? Maybe what I'll just do is I'll just jump in and kind of give you my thoughts on that. So, I see that when we have, when we're dictating to students what they have to learn, um, how they can participate, that uh, education is being done to them rather than something that they're necessarily participating uh, in with. And I think by embracing this philosophy of openness, we're really encouraging students to have more control, more power over their 
education. And so I would argue that as we move in this continuum toward greater openness, that we're actually um, giving students more agency and more power, and that can result in more learning. So one of the other uh, classes I teach here at ODU is a class in uh, assessment, classroom assessment, actually. And we talk about this with the assessment process as well, but the more assessment is something that we do with our students, uh, the more empowering it is, the more students tend to get engaged. Uh, but oftentimes with assessment, it's something that we do to students, much like in education, you know, we're teaching them and they're kind of sitting there more passively experiencing whatever it is that we have planned. Um, and I like this idea of openness that instead of, you know, it becomes something that we do to students, it becomes something that we do with students. So that's where my thinking is uh, when it comes to openness in education. And so the way that this manifests in my classes is by having students write their own textbook. And so my students are undergraduate students. Uh, this is in a teacher prep course. So this is one of the, the usually the first class that students take in their journey to become a professional K-12 educator. And so in this first course, I have my students write their own textbook. And so when I tell people that, they usually give me this, you know, look of horror, or if not horror, just real confusion. You know, you do what? You know, why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. You know, they're undergraduates. What are you thinking? Um, and so I'm curious, really, you know, what do you think about that idea of having students write their own textbook? Does that intrigue you? Do you see that there could be potential benefits or does it you know, horrify you? Something that you wouldn't want to touch with a with a 10-foot pole? What are your initial responses to this, you know, idea I'm throwing out there? Hey, what if your students wrote the textbook for your course? And again, since I can't see the chat, I'm really trying to figure out how I could see it. Um, if you can fill me in on anything that might be coming your way. Yeah, and feel free to speak up on your microphones as well, folks, but I'm seeing some responses here. It says, I'm intrigued but curious about the logistics. Um, one other person says, I'm not horrified. I've done it before. Ooh. <laughs> um, how about another person who says, I'm doing it with two different classes. Wow. Oh, hey, I found it. Yay, here it is. How exciting. Okay, great, great. Oh, this is really um, thrilling for me because I never find people who are also doing this. So I'm super excited to be among like-minded peers. That's a, that's a first. Usually I do get these looks of horror. So um, that's wonderful. Okay, so let me, let me share a little bit about why I do this. And then, you know, if other people are willing to chime in and explain why they do it, that would be um, really exciting for me to hear. But um, I'll kind of go through my list here. So I, I see this as being authentic, an authentic task where students have a genuine audience. Oftentimes, you know, K-12 education and also in higher education, we have students do assignments and their only audience is the teacher, right? They're just writing that 10 page research paper to turn into the teacher and it doesn't have a, an authentic purpose. And so when I can help it, I try to create assignments for my students that are more genuine in the sense that there is a real audience that will be consuming what they create. Uh, there will be a real purpose, you know, beyond entertaining me for, uh, uh, for grading purposes uh, that's tied to the activities that they do. You know, I also like the fact that creating your own text really involves students in these higher level uh, cognitive activities. They're researching materials, they're evaluating materials, they're synthesizing those materials, and they're creating something new. Uh, when they engage in peer review of each other's work, they're also evaluating. So we're really operating at high, higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy or higher levels of reasoning, however you'd like to um, label that. You know, students, of course, like saving money. Textbooks, as we all know, are getting prohibitively expensive. I think if you're here, you're interested in open educational resources. So you probably already bought into that idea that they're using open text uh, helps students out just financially. You know, I, I think we're also living in an age of technology, particularly a participatory culture where students are expected to be able to generate digital content. So a textbook, a digital textbook is another example of that. It gives them another tool set. Um, especially for me, since I'm training future teachers, being able to use different technologies to generate content is especially important. Um, many school districts, and I'm not sure what's happening there in Colorado, but certainly here in Virginia, we're seeing this, that K-12 institutions are getting rid of their textbooks. Instead, they're um, moving towards one-to-one -to -one models where students have a Chromebook or an iPad and all of their texts are digital. 
Um, so preparing teachers for working in that environment is a goal of mine. Um, also within my class, I have a philosophy of collective responsibility. So I don't believe students can just come to class and be an island where they're just doing their own thing and not uh, interacting with their peers. So I say to them, you know, if you're coming to class or you should be coming to class, and when you do come to class, part of your responsibility is to contribute to the learning of those around you. But particularly, this is important in education where we're teaching students to meet the needs of diverse learners from diverse races, backgrounds, you know, religions, uh, gender, gender expression, um, geographic regions, linguistic diversity, uh, you name it. And so by everyone contributing their unique perspective and sharing you know, their sense of the world with each other, we can all come away um, better prepared for our futures where we're interacting with diverse individuals and hopefully working collaboratively um, to meet our shared purposes. So also just this last one here, you know, regardless of what your future profession is, it's most likely going to involve receiving feedback and potentially giving feedback to others. Um, and that's a skill that we don't often teach in our classrooms, yet I feel is so incredibly valuable. So these are just some of the reasons why I do this project. Um, if anybody wants to um, share why they are engaging in this practice, I'd love to hear that. Um, it says here, someone is waiting to hear pros and cons. Yes, we'll definitely talk about cons as well. Um, you're very cutting edge here in Colorado. I'm wondering, Jonathan, what that means. Maybe you'll elaborate. Oops, turning the wrong way. So continuing with this idea of, you know, why do I do this? What do I see as being the benefits of students generating their own text? Um, you know, the biggest benefit, and it's kind of an umbrella term that um, encompasses many reasons, is the idea of student empowerment. That we're disrupting some of those traditional power structures where the teacher is making all the decision or the textbook publisher is making all the decisions about what students should learn. So we're transferring some of that power over to the students. And in that way, we're democratizing the production of educational resources. So students begin to have a hand in determining what they're learning and what resources they're using to engage in that learning. So students are getting to decide what's important, you know, instead of having that decision made for them. Uh, also, students are involved in evaluating their own course materials, which is funny about, you know, traditional textbooks is you would think that publishers would want to have students involved in the evaluation before they determine, you know, when a textbook is uh, selected for a course and what, get, what gets used. But more often I find that students aren't involved in that process. And instead, the folks who review textbooks are just, you know, other professors. Like someone might come to me and ask me to review a textbook, but it's not actually being reviewed by the 21 and 22 year olds who are using it. Uh, so the idea of involving students in that evaluation process for me seems correct, right? As well as empowering for students. And so I just like, I like this idea of students developing agency, of having, um, their voices heard in terms of you know what is being learned but also how we should begin to digest those topics that we're exploring you know maybe they have more motivation to read the textbook that they write i won't say that that's definitely the case because i still see that same problem that i wonder if many of you um, encounter where students don't like to read a text regardless of who wrote it So essentially, you know, in short here, I'm seeing this as a power transfer. We're shifting some of the power away from uh, the textbook publishers, away even from us as educators and giving more of it to our students so that our students become knowledge producers, they become authors, they become publishers. So you guys might be familiar um, with Downs. Oh, I forgot his first name right now. Maybe somebody can remind me. Uh, Stephen, right? Stephen Downs? Uh, who was the generator of one of the first MOOCs, one of the first uh, constructionist MOOCs. And he really talked about open educational resources and the fact that the people that are benefiting most from those resources are the people that are creating them. Right, and a similar quote here, the primary purpose of learner generated content is to stimulate knowledge growth within the learners. So for me, it really is about production and the learning process that is involved in that production of the text. So in this way, I really emphasize the value of this process of creating these texts more so than product. So we have process over product. 
um, you know, people ask me, why do you do this every semester? Why don't you just reuse the textbook once you've created it? And the answer to that is because for me, it's the production process that's so valuable in terms of student learning. Uh, the product, I think, is, is fine. It's nice to have it. It's, it's, it's good to share. Um, I think it's wonderful for students to have their work out there. But the true learning for me um, occurs in that production rather than in the consumption of the resource. All right, I'm trying to look here to see if I found out why you're cutting edge here in Colorado. Uh, Jonathan, you still haven't told me, so I'm, I'm curious. Um, but what does that mean you rewrite the books? Okay, so I'll we'll talk about that in a second. So um, my student's textbook, I've been doing this for a long time. So I started in 2007, and actually the project started the year before um, with some colleagues of mine in 2006. So we've been doing this quite a long time. Um, and by rewriting, what I mean is each semester, there's a new edition of the textbook. So we don't really build off of the textbooks that we've written in the past. Um, I've kind of played with this idea a little bit that maybe, you know, I could change the topic slightly and so we can still use some of the old content. And in some semesters I have used uh, some um, sample lessons and actually I do have two sample lessons that I use every semester. But for the most part, we're rewriting it in, in the sense that I have the same kind of list of topics uh, semester to semester with just small tweaks in that each semester students sign up for those topics and write their lesson about that particular topic. And so we're generating a new text each semester. And so I've done this project with anywhere from 30 to 300 uh, pre-service teachers participating in any given semester. And it is very scaffolded. There's a lot of pieces to this. My students complain, you know, why is there, why are there 50 assignments in my course? And it's because, you know, we have this big project, but I break it down into very small steps. So that's part of what helps me have some degree of quality in that final product. But I will admit right here at the beginning that it is uneven. You know, some lessons that students create within our text are top quality, excellent work, and some of them are not nearly um, so carefully constructed. Uh, but let me run through with you a little bit about the process so that you can um, begin to understand what goes into it um, on my end. And again, I'd love to hear um, what, what you guys do as well. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so I start out with the students creating an author page. And basically my idea behind this is, you know, any textbook if, or any book really, when you open it up somewhere in there, there's the about the author section. And so this is an opportunity for my students to write about themselves, a topic with which they're very familiar. And so it allows them to focus on using the technology and learning the technology rather than having to worry about um, creating the content. Since they already know about themselves, they're not doing too much research on who they are. And instead they're playing with different tools. Um, so that they could play with, um, you know, Google Slideshow or using Padlet or, you know, we used to use Glogster back when it was free and um, more easily accessible. Or they might use Toondo. Uh, so a number of different Web 2.0 tools they'll play with in order to generate the content that goes on to their, about their author page. So that's their first step. They're getting their feet wet and they're learning their technology and they're learning the technology. And then I have them respond to each other as a way to make the text more interactive and as also as a way of getting the students to, um, to, to learn about their classmates. So I'll show you what that looks like um, in a couple minutes. Uh, next, I have them go through and I have a list of topics that they can write about. Uh, so I have about maybe 75 or so different topics that relate to my course. And so I do pick those topics specifically so they align with my course objectives. So if this was something that you're interested in, um, um, taking on, then, you know, you'd probably want to go through a similar process yourself. You know, what topics could I have students write about? And there might be some things you're saying, well, no, this is not a topic that students can handle. These are writings, or these are, um, these are topics that are to be covered by required readings. But maybe here, maybe there's some space in this aspect of the course where students could do some research and create um, lessons or articles that are, uh, that would be viable for their students to be able to learn from. 
Now, sometimes students will come up with topics that aren't on my list and I encourage them to do that. If this is something that you're, if there's a topic that you're really interested in learning about that you'd like to share with us, then you know, pitch it to me. And if I think it works, then we'll include it in the text. Uh, so then they go and they conduct some research about their topic and I have a, a research assignment and I'll show you uh, what that looks like in a second, just to help them evaluate sources and begin to synthesize the material that they're finding. Uh, the next step in, is coalescing, combining, synthesizing that information into kind of a three or four paragraph essay so that they're at least beginning to get some of the knowledge that they need in order to generate their lesson for the textbook. We do a peer review at that point. So they're getting some feedback from their classmates about the topic that they've chosen, um, the information that they found, um, how they're beginning to write about it. And the next step is they take that information from their essay and convert it into a lesson. And I say that a, you know, an essay is different from a lesson. And I use this terminology of a lesson because I teach future teachers. But if you weren't teaching for future teachers, you could talk about it as, you know, a chapter or you know, what chapter in the textbook are they writing, or what article are they writing in the textbook. But since my students are future teachers, I use that terminology of lesson. That also helps me um, have them think about interactive technologies, that a lesson is not just text, right? It, um, you want it to involve questions and learning targets and, um, and maybe some ways for students to interact with the text. So they write a draft, they get some feedback from their peers on their draft, and then they have their final lesson that they create. Uh, then once that final lesson is done, we do an anonymous round of peer reviews. Um, students evaluate about six of their classmates' lessons. And then depending on how they're rated, they either get, um, um, they, they attain the status of having an official lesson, which goes into our wiki textbook, as required reading, or they get designated as a supplemental material lesson. And so that means that their lesson is still included in our textbook, but their classmates are not required to read it, and the classmates won't be tested on it. And so that's a way for me to vet the, list, the lessons and kind of discriminate between those higher status lessons, the ones that actually were well constructed, uh, the grammar's not horrific, Right, and I believe that the students in the class can benefit from reading it. Um, and so then essentially the, the textbook is done and the students are ready to read it and that occurs in the last month or so of the semester. And I actually take some of the questions that students have created in their lessons and I put those on the final exam. And so they are, text, they are tested on the text that they have created. So that's kind of the whole um, semester process and then what I wanted to do is um, show you what some of that looks like so you can see it. And then um, feel free to jump in with questions at any point, um, but particularly, um, I hope we'll have some time um, after I kind of show you some examples so that you can ask me about what I do and, and share with me what you do as well. So this is an example of an author page. And again, that's that assignment at the beginning. Um, so one of my students here, Alicia, you know, all the students have to write about what they know, what they have to learn, the teacher they will become. And so she used Padlet. Um, and she just has you know, some, some pictures and a little bit of text uh, addressing each of those four areas. And I'll, I'll show you some more as, as we go on. Here's a sign up sheet where you, know, you can see the different topics that I have within one um, chapter of the book. And the students are signing up to claim those topics. Okay, next here we have the um, lesson research assignment. And I think what I might do at this point actually is switch, I'm gonna switch over and attempt to actually pull up the actual documents themselves, which I think might be uh, more beneficial for you to see. So I mentioned that I had the students do research on their topic and then begin to synthesize some of the information that they find. And so I have them do this. This is probably a fairly standard type of assignment that many of you might have when you have students write a paper. You know, they have to find five sources. They have to evaluate the credibility of those sources. So they have their five sources they write here. And then I have them start to begin to synthesize. You know, write one sentence where you're citing two sources that agree on your topic. Um, write one sentence where your sources disagree. And they have to practice using APA, uh, they have to practice being able to write their own sentences where they're paraphrasing rather than just copying and pasting. So I don't know about you, but I get a lot of that copying and pasting going on in my classes. 
And I have students, you know, really trying to kind of refine the topic for their lesson and get some feedback from peers as to whether their, um, their lesson will be interesting to their classmates or not. So this is that first sort of research assignment that they do. And then the next step they go into is writing their essay. So compiling that information into a, a, about a four paragraph essay. Uh, they have to write some learning targets, you know, what people should come away with after experiencing their lesson or after reading their lesson. You know, what, are the, what are the three goals that you have? You know, so for example, defining a charter school, explaining why a child would want to attend a charter school, describing a charter school. And then for each of the three targets that they develop for their lesson, I have them write one paragraph. Um, and I'm having them cite sources using APA in each of those paragraphs. So, um, you know, I have tips for them here on, um, on writing sentence starters, that kind of thing. So I'm really trying to help teach writing uh, through this assignment and teach proper um, APA format. So after that, next would come their draft and then peer reviews and then their, um, their final one. I'm trying to think if I switch back here for a second. Um, you can see here is a student's um, essay and you can see that it's gone through um, a peer review process using Google. So students do their um, essay in Google Docs and then their classmates come in and make comments and make suggestions within Google Docs. So they're getting a lot of uh, rich feedback on the information that they've generated so far. Okay, this is a sample cover from a couple of years ago. Uh, the students, their pictures that they draw or photographs they take um, become covers. And again, I'd like this to be all um, student generated. Inside the Wikibook itself, we have different sections uh, focusing on different topics. Uh, this is actually a picture of one of my students when they were out doing a lesson. So that was kind of a, it's fun to be able to include some of those pictures in our Wikibook as well. All right, let me switch this out to back over here. So just to give you some visuals here, this is a sample lesson that I use uh, with my students. So it's actually from 2014. Uh, but it's a sample that I give them so that they can see what a lesson should look like. And so the lessons start with what I call an anticipatory set, some kind of hook, right, to bring people in, introduce the topic, get people uh, interested in the subjects. Because I tell them, you know, as a teacher, uh, one of the most difficult tasks you have is to get people to care about what it is you're teaching. And so it's the same thing when you're writing, you want to get people hooked in, right? So the beginning of the lesson starts with some kind of anticipatory set or some kind of hook. And the students have to have those learning targets, which you saw um, a second ago, and they have a, a, you know, about a paragraph or so that connects to each learning target. But in addition to text, I want them to have things like cartoons, uh, things like collages, things like videos in their lesson as well, so that it's not just text. Um, instead, it is multimedia. So this video at the beginning here in this case is actually this textbook author, um, her son has um, Asperger's or is on the spectrum. And so she interviewed her son and has this in here as part of her original content. That's part of her anticipatory set. So they go through, they have their three topics, they write about them, and then at the end, they have some kind of conclusion. Well, what can, you know, what's your conclusion? What's your takeaway from doing this research? What would you suggest for other future teachers? Um, you know, what, what, are, what are next steps that we should all be taking, taking related to your topic? And then here we have um, some multiple choice questions, and those are some of the questions that I might put on the final exam if they think that they're good ones. They have the answers to their questions and then their references. So this is what a lesson would look like inside the textbook. And if I'm clicking on here, here's a completed textbook from 2018. You'll see the different sections in here. Here's the about the author section and I actually put pictures of the kids in there. Um, if you click on the view all, you'll see all of the authors in there. Each one has their own um, author page. So if I'll just click on one at random here. Um, and they all have different ways of presenting their content. And here you can see Google Slides and Padlet. Um, I'm not actually even sure which this one will be. <laughs> uh, but the students are free to use kind of any Web 2.0 tools that they find. 
um, in their content section, then this is where the actual lessons are. So if we go into the section one that's on STEM education, um, there's a lesson here on methods for teaching math. You can see these are the official lessons. So these are the ones that were rated more highly. The supplemental content, those were ones that didn't quite make that cut. Um, so if we click on methods for teaching math, um, we can see uh, Reagan's lesson here. She's got a Google form, so she's got some interactivity built into it. Um, I'm wondering, um, so she's interviewed um, a teacher here as well. She's got a Google slideshow. So students, you know, they're presenting their content in different ways. And then also in the um, Wikibook, we include a help section. So if students get stuck, they have resources to go to besides me. And I think I'm bringing the, bring this back here. It's kind of giving you a, an overview then of the, the tour and what it looks like in the process. You know, and again, I'm having my students do the evaluations because they're the intended audience. I'm not the intended audience. So if I think their lesson is great, but it puts their classmates to sleep, you know, what's really more important? So I would argue that the students are a more important audience than I am. And that's part of why my students' evaluations are the ones that determine which lessons become the official ones and which ones become supplemental content. They also get their grade that way. Their grade is basically the average score that they received from their peers. And you know, people might say, aren't you just shirking your responsibility? Guilty? No, <laughs> um, no, not really. Again, I, you know, I don't think I am shirking my responsibility because I'm not the intended audience their peers are. And so by uh, turning the evaluation over to their peers, I feel that it's a more, a more valid measure of whether their lesson was successful or not successful. So um, I use Google Sites for creating my textbook. Um, I have used other things in the past. I've used Wikibooks. I have worked with uh, WordPress as well, but there are lots of different tools that you can use uh, to create a text with your students, whatever you're familiar with. If you have something that students, um, that they've already used in other classes or that they're going to be using in other classes, I definitely suggest that so that they feel that those technical skills are beneficial for them. Um, but really kind of any technology that allows students to collaboratively work together um, could work for this project. So why don't I stop there so that I can hear more about what you're doing and what questions you might have and we can have more of a discussion um, of how to make this more accessible for other faculty. Let's see if I can figure out how to bring you in here so I can see. Yeah, this is great, Jennifer. Thank you so much for the, the deep dive on your impressive work that you're doing with your students. Um, again, I'd encourage anybody to speak up that has questions. Um, I do see some things coming in through the chat and I have questions too, but I'll, I'll save some space for others. Okay, so do you make the various editions of the books created uh, via repositories or so? Um, I do have, I have a, um, a web page where I could share that with you and you could, you all could go in and see those. Uh, I don't make those immediately available to my students at the beginning because again, I, I, I have had students attempt plagiarism in the past where they'll, they'll just try to copy from somebody else's lesson and I do want them to generate their own. Uh, but they are, once students finish with the textbook, so near the end of the semester, I close off the editing capabilities and then make it accessible um, to the public. And so then it kind of, kind of gets added to my list of repositories. So I don't know if I fully answered your question, Ellen, but um, feel free to follow up um, if I didn't. And what did you find the most challenging when first implementing this? We you know, experimented with a lot of different models, like having students work together to create a lesson. Um, and there were pros and cons to that. You know, anytime you have students working together, it adds other variables in there. Um, the work might be higher quality, but then again, they might not have as much investment because it's not truly theirs. Um, students didn't always like it when other people were editing their work. And I think students like to have a sense of ownership. So I didn't feel that the collaborative lesson worked as well. Um, as I would have liked. So I went back to kind of this, you know, the single author model um, and just have students collaborating in terms of the peer reviews. 
um, I think there's a lot built into this. So I think kind of, you know, how do you scaffold this process in a way that you get the kind of quality that you want without completely overwhelming yourself and others is a, de is a delicate balance. So that's been a challenge for me, um, trying to figure out, you know, how much scaffolding is enough um, without having it be just, just too intense in, term, in terms of workload. Um, we are using a peer review system right now. We use Google Docs, uh, but then we also use one called Expertiza, which is run out of NC State. Um, and this semester, uh, some of their TAs left, and so I'm having some tech issues with that. So I think the tech, the tech issues are always there, you know, whether it's in the peer review system or whether it's you know, certain um, Web 2.0 tools that we would rely on all of a sudden aren't available anymore. You know, Glockster went to a pay model. Uh, the like Wordles and Tagzitos for generating those word clouds. I don't know if something's happened with those and, and those aren't accessible this semester. So I think, um, you know, kind of trying to keep tabs on the technology and making sure that everything's working uh, is tricky. You know, sometimes I would say, don't use Internet Explorer, it's the worst. And then the next semester, Internet, Internet Explorer will be the best tool, <laughs> which kind of, you know, blown my mind. Um, but just the, the technical aspects can be demanding as well. And that's why I say, you know, if you can choose a tool that you're already familiar with or that your students already have some familiarity with, um, that, that will, that will pay off for you and for them. Um, let's see, this seems like a great approach, especially for future educators. Do you see students implementing your approach in any of the work that they're doing with students? Um, I kind of wonder about that because I haven't had too many people come back and say that they've um, had their students write their own textbook, but I do think that it models this idea that technology is for production instead of, of technology being for consumption. And so often what I find with teachers is they, the way they use technology in their classroom is it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, just go do that, uh, that kind of automated worksheet or just go get on, jump on IXL or they're just, they're using it, um, they're not using it as a tool for production. They're using it as just like, this is a little tutorial or this is something that's gonna like, give you a quiz based on your reading level. But for me, the real power in technology is in the power of, uh, of uh, having students generate um, products, artifacts that they can share with one another. And so I think that that part I might be accomplishing, that students might be uh, engaging in using technology for generative purposes and not just for consumptive ones. Okay, um, do you think different disciplines or areas within a discipline are more or less appropriate for this approach? For example, I teach basic math, which people usually think of as very skills oriented. Maybe this is not as good an area for this kind of thing. So um, I would say that for certain subjects, like if you're teaching a technology course, it's great, right? Because technology textbooks get outdated, you know, every year. Uh, for something like math, what I have seen before, which for me was pretty exciting, was um, uh, the teacher had used it as a way, for, so kids could have a choice. Kids could either do their traditional homework assignment, or if they felt really confident with their homework assignment, instead of doing the traditional homework assignment, they could generate a kind of a tutorial or a how to do the assignment for their peers. And then uh, the teacher had compiled those how to videos into something like a supplemental text. And so for, for me, that was exciting because again, it's student generated content. The students are creating artifacts for their peers to use. It gives an authentic purpose to their homework. They're not just doing homework to turn to the teacher. They're doing homework to help their classmates. You know, also creating that video is probably more work than just doing their homework assignments. So you've also got the students kind of on the hook really investing their time and energy and resources um, in the work that they're doing. You know, they're also learning other skills. They're learning how to explain. They're learning a little bit about about video production, they're learning about how to articulate um, ideas clearly. So I think, you know, again, I don't know um, what age group you are, uh, Jonathan, for teaching math, but I think that idea of coming up with examples or tutorials uh, could be a great sort of text supplement for a math-oriented class. And maybe the folks here who said they already do it, and, and Jonathan, you are one of them, I'd love to hear, well, what subjects are you doing this with? You know, what have you found to be uh, successful or not successful? And maybe we can kind of riff off of each other there in terms of our success and not so successful stories.
Do, should, I, should I jump in and answer that quick? Can you hear me? Yeah. So my name is, um, I'm, this is Jonathan. I, I, I have done this in an advanced, I, I teach at a university and I've done this in advanced uh, math class, like a junior or senior level class. And, you know, the thing I did there was, um, I thought, it, you know, you've talked about how it, it often this, there's a, a lot of different learning goals that you, you can accomplish by this one approach. And I think that was the thing I, I liked. It was, there was the goal of the students learning the material but as well, there was an aspect of the students, um, you know, math students are terrible at writing um, and particularly also terrible at writing math, it seems to me. And, and um, you know, they graduate from, under, from college and they don't know how to write a thing that looks like good math text. And so it was a really, I think it was really beneficial for them to have this practice of being the ones responsible for writing things that their pet classmates would, would study. So I thought that was really beneficial. I mean, it required... I, I love your scaffolding. I think scaffolding is the key to making this approach work. You know, a lot of scaffolding um, can maybe reduce a little bit their autonomy, but I think that the examples you showed really show how you, you particularly at the beginning, you have to walk them through what is this going to entail and what are the parts you're looking for. So that was really wonderful that you shared. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's been developed over 13 years, so I didn't come up with the scaffolding overnight for sure. And, and a lot of times it was based on, well, what are the weaknesses, right? What are the things that I'm, you know, I want to be seeing, but I'm not seeing? And how could I kind of force that to happen? You know, particularly that the, um, the lesson research assignment where I have them, you know, write one sentence where you're citing two sources and saying where these two sources agree, and the one sentence where they disagree. You know, it, it's crazy to think that two sentences would be so hard um, for students, but you realize that they're, they're, that's not something that they have a lot of practice with, even though you think they would, um, right? But it's, I think it's something that they, they definitely struggle with. So identifying kind of weaknesses along the way and then kind of working backwards, well, how do I, you know, how do I address those? How can I kind of step it up for them? Was there somebody else in here who said that they were doing um, tax? Maybe you can share with us um, what you do as well. And um, this was where the cutting edge here in Chicago, I mean, in Colorado came from, right? That you're all uh, having student generated text. Oh yeah, Melissa, are you still here, Melissa? I don't know how I can see who's here. It looks like, I don't see her. It looks like we may have lost her or maybe she called in on a different line, but. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think that's interesting and I would love to facilitate an opportunity for you all to compare notes because I mean, even if you do run into a couple of people here and you're you know, preaching to the choir, so to speak, um, I still think it's pretty, um, Pretty yeah, prog progressive, innovative work that's that's being done, and I know Dr. Kidd, you've been doing this for a little while too, so um, it's exciting. But it'd be exciting to compare notes with people too. Absolutely, I think that's it's a it's a nice advantage. I mean, preaching to the choir, you know, yeah, maybe we need to expand, but sometimes pre preaching to the choir can be very beneficial because we you know, we learn from each other. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, are there any other thoughts, comments? Um, before we let Dr. Kidd go. Oh, Leah has a question. She said, have you worked with other faculty to adopt this? Um, I have, so people who have reached out to me, much like you all did, um, I've shared my resources and worked with them. Um, I've, I've worked with faculty who have done other kinds of uh, student-generated content, you know, whether those were maybe e-portfolios or blogs. Uh, I don't think anyone else here at ODU has fully embraced this idea of having their students um, write the textbook. Um, but other at other institutions, they have. I mean, I think that the, you know, as it goes, I get labeled as kind of a, a risk taker and um, tending to be more on the bleeding edge of technology, which is probably a fair assessment. So I will say that you know, this isn't a project that was necessarily easy, something that you could just, you know, okay, I'm just to start doing that and then it'll, it'll be simple, um, especially the way that I do it. I think that if, if faculty wanted to take it on as um, kind of a supplemental text that they were going to have their students share that was maybe more focused, um, 
that it might be an easier sell. But that many faculty are very intimidated by the idea of completely throwing away the textbook um, for their classroom. So let me just give this other example. I used WordPress a few years ago to create another student generated text, although this one was more personal in nature. Uh, the students uh, shared stories about uh, their identity development in middle school and high school. And um, we used a blog for this particular activity because we wanted students to, um, to tag their stories with different sort of demographic labels. You know, so students might say uh, black, they might say cheerleader, they might say Christian, they might say honor student. Um, and so what was interesting about that is that then I could have students go in and purposefully find narratives written by certain, by students representing different demographic groups. And so in that way, I was able to center the narratives of students from kind of underrepresented populations and make sure that those were read. So it was a really interesting supplemental text focused on discovering um, diversity and being able to see the world through somebody else's eyes. And so I, I, I think many of my fellow faculty are more interested in those kinds of projects where the writing is a little bit more personal, um, where it's something that's it's a project that's done kind of in addition to a standard text that's there. I, I think most faculty have been reluctant to fully abandon a traditional textbook. But, but Leah, do you ask because you're interested or are you just curious how hard of a sell it would be? I guess it's easier just to talk. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm a new instructional designer, learning experience designer, and I'm just I'm working with faculty and just in discussions of really effective way to, ways to engage with students. I'm just kind of, this is another tool in my toolkit. So just kind of curious what approaches you took and how hard it was to sell. Mm -hmm. um, it has been, I think it's been harder to sell than to do, actually. <laughs> really? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that just like I said, just, you know, there's, I'm, I tend to not be afraid of trying new technologies, and I find that um, not everyone has that same attitude. Uh, but I think if you, that's why I get, if you're going back to this idea, if you can find a technology that um, faculty are already comfortable with, uh, you might get new, more buy-in. But if they have to learn both the pedagogy and the technology at the same time, that's where I find that faculty are less willing to make that investment. You know, so how can you, how can you leverage their comfort with an existing technology and then say, well, hey, what if your students use this? I mean, a lot of faculty are becoming increasingly comfortable with Google Docs and you could easily create um, a text with just linked Google Docs or in some kind of a shared folder. Um, and I think that wouldn't be nearly as intimidating. And once faculty begin to understand how wonderful it is to be able to give students feedback and to have students give each other feedback within Google Docs, uh, you know, I think that that might be an easier sell. Now, I've actually had students you know, working on assignments and we end up having to course in real time in the margins of their paper, you know, through the Google comments. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that, that technology and the power of that technology might help um, sell this to faculty who might initially be reluctant. That makes sense. Thank you. Can I jump in for Mark on that too? Um, I I noticed when I did when I had my advanced math students doing a textbook, we did it in a in in a wiki, and so there's all the learning how to make you know write wiki text. It's this markup language to to do things, and also they were writing math, so they had to learn how to make math look pretty, and that scares the hell out of faculty, I think, but the students took to it without a blink. I mean, they, they got all that instantly. So I, don't, I think we, we faculty tend to be kind of scared of imposing new technologies at the same time as this new pedagogical innovation. But I think the students are so used to so many different technologies on their phones that they don't really have any troubles with it at all. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I always joke about that. It takes me five minutes to explain something to my students and 45 minutes for me to explain it to <laughs> Exactly. You know, I, 
yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why, but yeah, I, and I used to do that. We used to do our book and wiki books and they had to use the, uh, the wiki markup language and some of them did have a hard time with it. So that's why I eventually moved to uh, Google sites because it was, you know, WYSIWYG editor and we didn't have to do the, the text. But I think in a math class, I think using some kind of markup language is actually not a bad idea, right? Cause it, you know, it seems like there's some, I don't know, similar objectives, right, in terms of like translating into math and translating into code. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's, it's, it's that, so it's in a certain, certain sense, it's serving that other learning goal of, you know, developing mechanisms for translating from symbols into mental constructs and back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm excited to hear that you've taken on this project, Jonathan. So. You should, you should send me your text so I can have a have a look at your textbook and see how it looks compared to ours. I will be up for her in a couple minutes. Awesome. Well, um, thank you again, um, Jennifer, for joining us. This has been fantastic. I'm glad we could have some conversation towards the end here, too. Um, question for you, which I did not ask you before. Are you okay with us sharing this video for those who couldn't attend? We have some folks who were able to attend. Um, some who weren't, but um, we can talk about that offline too if, if you're not, but um, yep. Um, and so if we, if we were able to do that, it'd be great. I know there are some people who, you know, it's Monday and they're, they're um, not able to come, but uh, yeah, maybe we can talk about that too. Um, so think about it. <laughs> yeah, that seems fine. Great. No problem great. With that. And thank you again, everybody else, for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, and I will, I will share, um, if you're interested in getting contact with, with Jennifer, um, Jennifer, I can connect you with Jonathan or Leah or, or others who were uh, wanting to kind of compare notes and things like that. That would be, that would be fun. Um, so happy to facilitate that as well. And thank you all again for joining us. Hopefully this was helpful, and we will talk to you next time. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks again. And should I stay on then? You want to talk this way? Oh, um, yeah. You know what? Let me just...